seated. We're going to uh, take these few moments here, and there are several uh, great sessions here, and they have asked me to talk about some current theological challenges. And so we've chosen uh, five just to uh, take a look at. And so how many love the Word of God here today? So, of course, uh, there can be differences in uh, belief, and there can be differences in ways of looking at things. We sometimes call that interpretation. But then there are times that belief destroys the message. And so we have to be very, very careful. How, mu how many want to be sure we preserve the message for the next generation? Now, they're very interested in us. A couple days ago, this is kind of shocking. Some of you need to uh, hold on to your seat. But I actually got a call from the Assemblies of God and asked me to come and teach for four hours on the oneness of God at their seminary. Now, I considered that to be... Uh, well, at first, I, I was completely baffled. I was just like, well, maybe there must, you know, you think there must be some, there must be something else to this. And, uh, but actually we did that. Tonight I want to share a little bit of uh, how that went and some of the good things that came from that. But how many believe that the truth marches on? The truth is never at a loss. The truth is always right. It matters not who I am. It's not my personality. It's not, not my ability. It's not my capabilities. It's not your capabilities. It's not my uh, intellect is not my money. It's not what I have. It is all about this wonderful Jesus that we serve. And we, folks, now listen, I'm, I only brought that up for one reason, to say that's the one reason I was there. This apostolic church is making news. They are wondering, whoa, whoa. They said, we cannot believe the rate of growth of this movement. And I said, well, you, you need to start believing it because it is really taking off. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But let's talk about some things that could affect us if we if we left them. And so we're looking at the an apostolic, or perhaps uh, reflected through my eyes, a response to current theological challenges. Now, tonight I'm going to, in our discussion of the Godhead, I'm going to look at the, the problem of thinking that the Lord's flesh was divine for just a moment. But we're not going to do that this morning. But let's look at uh, five things, current challenges, that I think we need to consider their inherent danger. Now, the, one of the uh, problematic areas for all of us in, in loving the Word of God is to somehow think that uh, this cu the cultural attitude about uh, whether or not it really matters, and that's really what postmodernism postmodern is, is, the idea that things don't really matter. And it sort of, in a way, takes the high ground. Well, listen, it doesn't really matter. It's all about just us standing up here on the hill. But, of course, the truth there knows that there was one hill, and that was the hill of, that, of Calvary and where Christ gave his life, and therefore that is the sole place. Does anybody here believe that it takes the blood to be saved? Yes, it does. Now, we're in a day when you can get the pastor of the largest church in America, and he can't be sure if, if, you, if men are sinners or people need to be saved. But I can tell you right now, I was once a sinner, but now I'm saved. I've been changed because the Word of God. And this, this is what is the strength of the oneness movement. We are a Bible-believing people. Now, they shocked me one thing, and, I, and everybody say, praise the Lord. I, I'm, I'm going to try not to do this, and so I'm, I'm going to have to hold real tight here. But um, one thing they said to me, and it really shocked me, they had me in a meeting with all the staff of the Assembly of God Theological Seminary, and there was a whole room full. And I was, that was my most, uh, I, I was most concerned about that. What was this all about? They're going to have me speak and give a paper to the entire faculty of the Assembly of God Seminary? That just seemed very interesting to me. And one of them said to me, and, and actually sent up, uh, uh, it was in writing, I forget exactly how I got it, but it said in there that the oneness movement had been far more committed to the Bible than we have been. And they were like, they were saying, we've got to be very careful here because uh, we're seeing, they were kind of saying they're seeing some slippage and so on, and, and they were concerned. We had a talk, for example, about the statistics about how many Assembly of God people are speaking in tongues, and, and the numbers are going down. And I said, well, you know, Dr. Rumhofer and Tinland, they, they're saying it's somewhere between 12 and 17, and they've been doing on this for years. And, uh, and he said, well, no, I don't think it's 12. I think it might be maybe even 40-something percent. So we were quibbling over 20%, and I said, you know, that, that's not the issue here. The issue is not whether you're down below 40 or down below 30 or down below 20. The issue is, what are we preaching? What is this message all about? This is a message about the Word of God. That's what this message is about. And, of course, once we do that, we have to be very careful. Young people, it's very important that we not succumb to the I'm okay, you're okay, this intoxication of the world's acceptance, this idea that, 
Now, folks, I think we should know our Bibles inside out. And our Bible schools cannot just become prophetic clubs and, and where we all just sort of, uh, you know, smooth each other and pat each other on the back. No, no. Our Bible schools have got to be where we study and love the Word of God, where we run the aisle, we preach the gospel, we love the truth, because it is the Bible that is the foundation. Someone said, well, all I need is spirit. No, no, no. You cannot have spirit without the Word. It cannot come. So we have to be very, very careful. And like David, we have to know that there's a cause, that what we're doing is important because there's a cause. Now, there are five areas here that I want to cover, and it's going to be very tough. Say amen. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm just going to do it. So we're going to look at five areas. The first one is what I'm calling textual criticism, and that, of course, is challenging the trustworthiness of the Bible. And it's done very uh, very cleverly, and usually you have to know a lot of Greek and Hebrew, and uh, then you can challenge the Bible. You know, it's like if you had one guy, I was at a university a few months back, and he said, uh, uh, how, how much Greek have you had? And I said, well, how much Greek have you had? And uh, so, you know, I knew what that game was going to be. Did I have five years, ten years? I said, uh, you know, keep going up, go up, go up. And uh, finally, he, he stopped. He had reached his level of Greek. And so the idea there was we'd match wits. How many of you're never going to match wits? This is not about matching wits. It's not about ability. And so men have been challenging the Word of God on faulty foundations. And the second one is the humanism, the ex- exclusivity of biblical claims. In other words, the Bible may be good, it may be fine, but it's just another book, and so we need to put it out there in the postmodern setting where it, everything is fine. And then the third area we're going to cover is briefly easy believism, and that is to challenge the essentiality of New Testament salvation. That is to uh, argue that perhaps it doesn't take the blood, perhaps it doesn't take uh, certain things, and, and we're going to look at that through the lens of easy believism. Can you say praise the Lord? Now we're coming to one that I'm, you may or may not be familiar with, but we're going to call it preterism for lack of a better term, and that is the challenge of a futuristic coming of the Lord and that prophecy is future. How many believe that the Lord is coming? Anybody here believe the Lord is coming? All right, well this is a challenge to the idea that the prophecy of Scripture is actually real or that it uh, has yet to be fulfilled. And then our fifth one is a look at the doctrine of openness, which of course is exactly what you would expect from a postmodern culture because openness limits God. So let's, first of all, let's take a look here at the centrality of doctrine. Now, without the Bible, all is subjective. If we don't begin with Scripture, then we are left at the whim of personality. Whoever is the biggest prophet or whoever has the most influence or is smartest or whatever, then we're left with, uh, to our own devices. Someone could manipulate, contrive, and the super prophet and so on could take over. But in fact, the scriptures are given to us. Let's look at First Timothy 1 and 3, and of course, uh, hopefully this is in your notebook. First uh, Timothy chapter 1 verse 3 says that he gave them a charge that they teach no other doctrine. Let me say no other doctrine. And then we come to verse 10, which is this uh, very interesting statement. Anything that is contrary to sound doctrine. Now the word here, the Greek word here means to be healthy. So not in the sense of standing on something that's solid. We Some might think of it as solid doctrine, and there is this scripture and, and reasons for thinking of doctrine as being solid. But here we're talking about doctrine that is healthy or well, that is good. And how many are thankful for the doctrine that we've been taught in the church? Thank God for our pastors and for our leaders that are committed to the doctrine. And of course here, even in uh, Timothy, he, he goes through, look at these examples that you find in in your notes here, first of all, the king is the only wise God. How many know Jesus is the king of kings? And so the Bible is very clear on the doctrine of who Jesus is, that he is the only, it would say only, he is the only wise God. So I'll squeeze a little one to scripture in here. That he is God our Savior. Now this is Paul's a way of squeezing in or showing us using terms like king and savior, which is what we always contributed to Jesus, to now attribute them to uh we contributed the Savior to Jesus as his, in his earthly realm. Now we're contributing them to Jesus as God. He is the only wise God. He's the King of kings. He's God our Savior. And so, how many know Jesus is God? How many believe that? And then he uses this expression, the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his most common way of speaking. But then every once in a while, he just calls the gospel of God. Now, many liberals are never convinced by that. They're still convinced that Jesus is not God. But is anybody here convinced today that Jesus is exactly who he said he was? He is the beginning and the ending. He's not in between. He's not second. 
And there, of course, in chapter 2, he says there is one God. Now, in Second uh, Thessalonians, uh, I'm going to borrow from that to use two other scriptures here as we are looking, actually three more scriptures, but this next overlay, we're looking at chapter 4, because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. How many see that as a very clear one in the scripture? Because we trust in the living God. By the way, when I was there, it was very encouraging to be uh, in a seminary classroom with, with all kinds of students and be able to say, now let's take a look at some scriptures and see why oneness people. For example, the first question they asked in, and when they say, praise the Lord, I'm trying not, I'm trying not to go to bed. I'm trying not to do that. Um, but they said, um, why is it that you're oneness and you've got, uh, you know, here's, here's your background and here's your belief. And you were Trinitarian, you were somebody of God, yes? And then, then you begin to look at scripture differently. You, now you, now you believe differently. What was the difference? I said it was the way I read scripture. It was the way I began to understand Scripture. When I was reading Scripture as a Trinitarian, I was reading it from a certain standpoint. So I said, that's what I'm here to do. I spent four hours explaining to them what happened when I began to read Scripture with the proper grid. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. And they said, I said, now look at it this way. Let's look at that Scripture without anything else and just look at it. Because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. Does that not sound like it's talking about the one God, Jesus Christ, who came and died for the whole world? Well, if you weren't looking at through the grid of Trinitarianism, you would see it differently. Before light bulbs begin to go off and they lined up out the door, they said, I've never, ever, ever considered that option. How many know this gospel, this is just the beginning of the great options that we have as a church? Folks, this is an awesome day. Young people, this is the most awesome day the church has ever known. And then he said, he's the savior of all men, especially those that believe, do things command and teach. And then in verse 15 he says, give thyself holy. And we say holy. Give yourself wholly to them. So I, I wrestle with that. So, uh, but it certainly means when you give yourself wholly, I don't think it means don't raise your family, don't do anything but sit there with the Bible in front of you all of your life, of course. Holy is to be qualified in some sense, but it certainly could not mean you hardly ever pick up the Bible and you hardly ever pay any attention and so forth. They would say, Amen. So let me go to verse 16, and that is this. Take heed unto thyself. They would say, Take heed. Take heed unto thyself and unto the what? Unto the doctrine. Now here we have epimene or to focus on, to, to abide in. So that, I see that as two different, those are two lexical meanings there. To epimene. Now the, the origin of this word, which might help us, it might not, but the origin of epi, of course, is to be upon, and mene means to remain. So if I stay right on the word of God. Now folks, let me tell you, that's the devil's trick is to take this book and make it appear that it is nothing but this is God's Word I'm holding in my hand. This is the Word of God, and I want to dwell upon it. I want to stay upon the Word of God. And so I hold fast the form of sound words. Now this, this is interesting because here we have another Greek word, which I'm sure these are in your notes there, but this word means to have the exact pattern. And, uh, of course, that is contrary to postmodern thought, that there's such a thing as an exact pattern. And so that takes us now. So everybody say, praise the Lord. We love His Word, and we need to be very careful that nothing is allowed to undermine His Word. And certain things, and certain things in our mind. For example, if our young people begin to believe that certain scriptures shouldn't really be in the Bible, or that certain things in the Bible, well, that I can judge them because I'm superior to the Word of God. Nobody in this room is superior to the Word of God. The Word of God is above all of us. So we begin with our first one, and I'm, I'm judging the time. So let's take a look at textual criticism, which is actually an attack on the Bible. Now this, in my, in my mind, is uh, pure arrogance. To think that you are above the Word of God. When in fact it has lasted all of time. In fact, in the beginning was the Word. I would say in the beginning was the Word. It's arrogance to think that your intellect or your ability or somebody who taught you could cause you to rise above the Word of God. To stand in judgment of the book of books. That is truly an elitism that is almost mind-boggling. Does anybody here love the Word of God in this place? We're here this morning, look at this beautiful group. We're here this morning because we love the Word of God. But we need to be very careful. 
because we're sending our students more and more. And I please forgive me for uh, this uh, sort of personal type approach here, but we, our young people are going to carry this message. As long as, as the Lord hasn't come in a few years, and I believe he's coming very soon. Anybody believe that? I believe he's coming soon. But if he were to tarry his coming, then we are, we are having to transfer the baton into the hands of others and it must it cannot just be based on, based on some charismatic feel goodism and, and good looks it's got to be predicated upon an understanding of the word and what is happening in most seminaries in most places except they cannot understand it the Pentecostal movement has been an absolute enigma to the world because here it was the backwoods people and suddenly they're coming in and they're growing faster than any church in the world and then come along and these people that say, wait a minute, you haven't gone far enough. It's more than just talking in tongues. We've got to get baptized in Jesus' name like the Bible says. And now these folks are out going to Trinitarian, uh, in different parts of the world, different ways. In fact, that was one of the things they, they wanted me to talk about. Just how fast is the, was this one that's really growing and why? Why are they growing like this? Oh, everybody say praise the Lord. So we have to train our young people to understand that we are now at a juncture of time where there have been four centuries of attack upon Scripture. But the psalm says, Forever, O Lord. Everyone say, Forever, O Lord. Thy word is settled in heaven. Now, I've been in all these seminary classrooms where they say, well, maybe settled in heaven, but it's not settled in earth, and all these things. The arrogance, folks, becomes almost unbelievable. But I think you can cure a lot of things by just getting on your knees and lifting your heart. Ever have a time when you're wrestling with something? But many times, when I was a Trinitarian, I spent years wrestling with the doctrine of God and felt I was abandoning the people that I loved the most. But it was this book that we had to stand for. And there are many people in this world right now that are in the same place. They're waiting on our churches to declare the truth and step out of centuries of doubt. Yes. Why are you getting me all stirred up? Now let's go on. Let's go on. Go to the next slide because I'm going to go quickly past this. Now some of you are going to be scared and if you get really, really scared, I know it's close to Halloween, but we're looking here at enlightenment rationalism. That is the higher critic said, we're above the Bible. The Bible has struck many mistakes. We need to throw the Bible away. And Voltaire said, in a, in a century, the Bible will be gone. Well, Voltaire's gone and the Bible's right here on the pulpit for God. And men that were doubters said, like Cox, Cox said, well, there's no reason to believe. I want to tell you something. There's every reason in the world to believe. The Word of God is forever settled. And young people, listen to me. I don't, I don't know if you take this or believe it or think it, but you have every reason to believe and trust the Bible. Regardless of what the doubters have said or think, the Bible is true. And then, of course, as we heard a moment ago, Hegelian thought, Kierkegaard, these men, and I say this with tears this morning, this type of doubting, this little timeline is not meant to be anything special, just meant to illustrate that 400 years of, we don't know, have answers, we don't know whether the Bible is true, has left the world in the hands of great despair and doubting theologians and empty-heartedness and, and not sure if the gay is good or we can't even be sure if killing people is, is bad. We can't even judge criminals. We're to the point now that we're beyond having any answers whatsoever. All of this due to the rejection of the Bible. So I would take the Bible and hold it high. In the midst of a wicked and perverse nation, I would hold the Bible high. And when they say, well, I think I can prove a text over there, the Greek says this, 99% of them have never seen the Greek text. You'll ask them, I've challenged everyone, well, the Greek text there, show me the Greek text that challenges that. Well, I, I've never seen it, but I read, no, 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 I don't want to know what you read over there, that's good send me there, but before we do, I want to know why you're doubting, why you have no faith in the Word of God. That may be why you're not talking in tongues and baptized in Jesus' name. It takes faith in the Word of God. You have to believe the Word. Now, this is very close, by the way, to the emptiness of Buddhism, which said man enters the water and through that little, I don't know if you can see it, man enters the water and causes no ripple. Well, these are lies. Those notions are not 
true. Man is not a zero. Even though man may be lost, is everybody with me? Is this okay? I know I'm a little deep here. Man may be lost. Let's go to the next one. Some are very nervous. Go on to the next slide. Though, though man may be lost, he is not a zero. How many know what I'm saying? Someone said, well, if man is lost, he's a nothing. No, 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 no. God, he is so much something that the blood ran down the cross that his feet had nailed, driven through them because we are not zeros. And so we've got to keep this right. Everybody say hallelujah. So, the failure of modernism and postmodernism are have led us to a meaninglessness in theology. But, the, but Timothy said all scripture is given by inspiration or the opiusos or by the breathing out of God. So we lift our hands and thank God for his word all over this building. Father, we do thank you because every scripture is given by the very breath of God. It's just like your spirit. Your spirit is invisible, but it moves where it wills, and so it has breathed out the very words of life. Jesus himself said, and I have, and I challenge you here today to consider, Jesus said, I, verily I say unto you, I would say verily, verily I say unto you, truly, quit thinking that just because somebody disagrees with you, listen folks, this is our day. God has called us to this hour to be steadfast in the word. We are not going to take our future into some other direction. We have a future that is leading us right where God wants us to go. I pray, different from my Trinitarian background, where those churches have changed totally. They're unrecognizable. They're really not the same churches that I was a part of. Neither in holiness or shortly after they... You know, folks, if you're willing to sell it, then that affects everything. There are some things that are just not for sale. They're not for sale. I'm not bargaining with you. I'm not bartering with you. But when you say, well, I'm not sure about this, and you know the culture, and <clears throat> we've got to be relevant, and, and they're rethinking these things. But it's for me to been too late. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, so heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle. Now a jot or a tittle, I think over to the side there you see the Greek Yoda, and then you see the Hebrew. That's the Hebrew word uh, Elohim, or, no, Elohim. And the reason I put that there is I think the pariah, which is the second Greek word, pariah, is referring, or most scholars think, or many scholars think it is, it's not absolutely certain what it is. Now, Yoda, we know that's the, the little, like an I in the English language without a dot on it. Jesus said it would be easier for heaven and earth to pass away before one single yud will slip out of Eloheinu. That's what Jesus is saying here. That's how careful they were to preserve the Word of God. How many are thankful that God gave us His Word and that we are not left to the devices, the Chinese. They tried to destroy the Chinese church. Today, the most awesome revival of oneness people is in China. In Russia, they tried to destroy Christianity in Russia. Communism, their idea was to exterminate Christianity. But they could not do it. So the devil's come out another way. In fact, far more uh, powerful way of sort of getting what he wants is to, is to tell the lie that it really doesn't matter. Go ahead, believe what you want. We like you. Come on, talk to us. Let's dialogue. It makes no difference because we like you, you like us. It doesn't matter anyway. Far more powerful than saying, you say, well, hey, if they came and beat my door down, they beat their doors down in country after country after country. When they left China, the doors, because they're still, obviously China's still in communism, but when, when they let up a little bit and they, and they begin to go in and look at what was happening in, in China, Christianity had absolutely mushroomed. It was going, it was growing at exponential rates because under the oppression, how many knows that the devil cannot stop the truth? The devil cannot stop the word of God, and not a single yod is going to slip out of him. Eloheinu, yes. Someone said, well, "I'm not sure." I even, so I'm going to stop there because I'm getting a little stirred up. Now let's look at ecumenism. Now, um, and because I have four more to just quickly look at. Now there are several problems with the idea of postmodern pluralism, and one I would recommend that you look at this new book by Lee Chen called "The False Dawn." in which he says the etymology of the word for ecumenism is, 
is listed here in English letters, or to meme, which means the whole inhabited world. But one of the things that the uh, somebody got asked me to do, they sent me a new book, and it was called The Spirit Poured Out. And we said, they said, there's a whole chapter on the one that's moving in there, and we would like you to respond. Dr. Uh, Amos Young is a young Assembly of God uh, scholar who now teaches at Regent. They used to be in Minneapolis, and uh, he has a chapter about the oneness. Very interesting. And they wanted to know, was it accurate? It was, was a huge chapter. In fact, the latest two, the latest two major Pentecostal volumes, in fact, I don't know the, the name of the award, but uh, there's a special award given to Pentecostal authors when they have the finest book written in a given year. It's actually presented, it may be called the Numa Award, but I'm not sure, but it's given at the SDS meetings. I was there. And it was given to a, an author by the name of Jacob, said, as far as I know, he's not a Pentecostal, as far as I know, I don't think he is. But he wrote a book called Thinking, uh, what is it, Brother Brown? Thinking in the Spirit, I believe. 80 pages are all about the oneness of and people were saying, wow, there's an entire chapter in this book, and it's won the award for the finest Pentecostal writing in that given year, and a huge section of the book is about the growth of, well, about the impact of the one that's moving. It has a whole section on R.C. Lawson. Did any of you here know about R.C. Lawson? Well, here's one about, any of you ever, ever heard the song, What a Mighty God We Serve? Well, Lawson was healed of tuberculosis in this city. He became one of the great preachers of Pentecost. He started the Church of Our Lord, and, and, and found he, it, it, right now the churches he started, there are five of them. The smallest one runs a thousand. They have a whole section in there about the early ministry and the writings of, of Lawson. And I said to some of them, you, you are reading right now things that some oneness people have never read. They are not reading the writings of our early leaders. Some are, some aren't. And we're trying to get some of this material back out. We know it's old. We know that it's gone the way. New good material's out. But how many knows that the truth never changes? This, this work, and yet they're writing their biggest book in their sense. We've got to include a huge chapter on the oneness movement. Now listen, young people, this is an awesome day for the church to recognize what we were called to do. We were not called to compromise with this world. We were called to love and stand for the Word of God, whatever that be. But now let's look, though, at what Dr. Young would like. He'd like for us to do these two things. Uh, and we'll look at more of this later. The origins of ecumenism, Dr. Sweet says, and I'm quoting now from Dr. Sweet, were in the early 20th century aimed at Christian unity, though it now seems beyond that, to try to know, understand, love others as they wish to be known and understood but seeks to avoid confrontation, to locate where people disagree, to find ways of bringing the parties to live and work cooperatively, and perhaps to discern new or previously unrecognized truths. Now, to me, what has just been stated are examples of dangerously naive folk. Because the truth and error can never mix. They cannot mix. Now, in our culture, of course, the starting point is to get us, as uh, the Walden was just talking about, to move a little further, perhaps. And, of course, the starting point for postmodernism is to reject the Bible. They're superior to it. And, therefore, we have to... Uh, cause Christianity to lose its edge or its uh, exclusive tone and the belief to no longer be absolute. And then, of course, there is a major bias against Christianity so that the one belief that's not tolerated is believed that there is an absolute truth. So the church in this hour is facing a culture that is more and more embracing these kinds of ideas. So, 
It's going to take courage. We need some David that are going to stand. Does anybody feel the presence of God that is challenging us to stand strong no matter what? I believe it's happening. I believe that's one reason they're going to be saying, hey, come on. And they're going to be watching. What about, oh, I'll tell you that. Well, let's just go. Let's go to the next one. So we have a tremendous challenge. And I would never have believed that we would be standing as we are today. Just standing, declaring, and believing that God is able to do it. Now, let's go. Let's go. Let's turn the page and let's look at easy believism. Now, basically, all this is interrelated. The idea that there is a licensed lifestyle, that it doesn't matter how I live. But actually, no one has a right to change the oneness of God into a mysterious morality. Do you believe that here this morning? Nobody has the right to say, well, now, we, we better understand the Bible than the apostles did. And so we are, we're now interpreting the Bible. It really was Trinitarian. It used to be very perplexing to me how the Bible didn't have the word Trinity in it, and yet it was purportedly teaching a doctrine that it never used. So I said, well, you could have a doctrine. You could have a doctrine be teaching it and not name that doctrine. But where in the New Testament does the Bible name, or not name, but, but teach the doctrine of the Trinity? Well, uh, one, one guy, uh, head of the Bible department at Wheaton said, well, tell me, you know, the, what, what do you expect from dumb fishermen? They, they did not know. I'm glad that you said, ooh, because I said, ooh. It did something. That was the day. Now, folks, that was the day that I made up my mind. The only way I was going to survive this was to just hold on to the truth. Because if these men actually believed they were smarter than the Apostle Peter, that they were dumb fishermen. Oh, Jesus. So while I raised my hand, I said, now when was he stupidest? When he, when he went to the gate and he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up! Was that when he was really dumb? Now, tell me, I didn't, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it like that. I said, that's how dumb I want to be. No one has the right to alter the formula of Jesus' name baptism to conform to a trinity for any reason. Or to alter it to put the two together so it makes everybody happy. Nobody has a right to do it. All we have a right to do is obey the Word of God. And no one has a right to replace the new birth of water and spirit with mental ascent believism minus holiness. It cannot be, it cannot be done and please God. Now let's look, for example, at John 3, 5. Ready? Say, praise the Lord. We're almost there. Come on, folks. We can do this. We can do it. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So, the dean of theology at a major seminary. But now Talmud here, he's one of the oneness, the oneness tradition, and he thinks that water there means baptism. And do any of you others here believe that? Then that would mean that baptism is part of salvation. And if you don't get baptized, then you're not uh, saved. And he said, I'd like to... Uh, just mention this because the water here is most likely referring to the water of human birth. And that you're to be born of the water in your mother, and then you're to be born of the Spirit. And that's to be born again. So first you're born human, then you're born again. Verse 6 says, that was his precious breath. So we said, well, we'd like uh, Thomas to explain why he would put so much so much emphasis. I said, well, first, I would only put the emphasis that Scripture puts on it. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's the emphasis I will put on it. And it said, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's the emphasis I will put upon it. So I'm not here to share what I think is right, but I do think the scripture is clear. And I said, now let's look at this one, because this was like this one called exegesis fast. Anyone know what that is? Not one of the wives of the apostles. Exegesis 
is when you, uh, the Greek word for get the meaning out of Jesus means no and ice means to get it out. And so you get the meaning out of scripture. So you go to the Bible and you look and you look and you look and somebody says, I think water there means, uh, means human birth. I said, well, that's strange on several counts. I said, first of all, the context here is baptism. I show that on this slide. I gave you this on purpose because I'm, I'm more often hearing people saying, well, you know, we've got to find ways to neutralize oneness doctrine because they're outgrowing us. They're never going to neutralize oneness doctrine. They're never going to stop the truth because the truth is going to march on. The Word of God is always right. Young people, get armed with the Bible. Get armed with the Word of God and hold it in your hand. So I said, first of all, let's look at the Greek. I said, now here we have X, Hudetas, Kai, Numetas. Now, of course, this is a Greek exegesis class that I'm the only one in the room that believes that water means baptism. Now, let's look at why. Besides the other scriptures, let's look at this scripture. First of all, there is no article. Everybody say hallelujah. Does anybody want to, does anybody want to run an aisle? We feel like running an aisle? Yeah, I do. Oh, no, I'm just saying, I feel like right now, when I said that there's not an article, that made me almost want to run an aisle. And nobody responded in this whole room. But the fact that there's no article instantly tells me something about the text. Because there are numerous rules which explain when you use and when you don't use an article. And when you have a preposition like ek, how many can see this? Let me do this. This is the wrong way. See that little word right there? The Greek word ex. The Greek word ta, okay, that's missing. So that tells me that it's non articular. The reason you would pull out an article was to show something. And why do we pull articles from two things at one time? To demonstrate that they are one thing. Can anybody challenge that here? Could you show me one example where you would pull the article? And they said, well, I could. Then we started that. I said, let's look at them. But could we all admit? that almost all the time you would pull the article because you wanted to say water and spirit. They're one thing. You say, what's that one thing? One new birth. The water is baptism and the spirit is the Holy Ghost. It's one birth. That's what I believe. I didn't say it quite like that. And I didn't say it like that. But I did say it. So, the truth of the matter is, that if you wanted to say born of the water and you meant the birth from your mother, this would not be the way to say it. The way to say that would have been put that word ta in front of water and the word ta in front of spirit to show I'm, I'm separating these two. That's one way to do it. But there's another thing. I said we have the word X here, which without a separate usage of the preposition, then most of the time is it not true that when you put two words together with one preposition, everybody say hallelujah. Come on, I'm losing some of you. Everybody say hallelujah. You put one preposition next in front of that, out, born out from the water and out from the spirit. Why would you just use one preposition? If you meant they were two separate things, you would throw in another. Or even if you didn't, you would surely, not surely on two counts, you wouldn't make this so nebulous as to think, well, maybe this is two separate births, a human birth and a spiritual birth. How many believe that you must be born of the water in the name of Jesus and you must be born of the Spirit? Let's clap our hands together. I believe that. You must be born of the water and of the Spirit. And so it is. We must be born of the water and the Spirit. And it goes on to say grace is not a license for sin because freedom doesn't mean that we're free from God's law like many today are saying. So let's go on. Now let's look at the fourth one. And then we, we will conclude here. And this is the subject of preterism. It would say preterism. Now preter, of course, is just... Uh, uh, the, the Hebrews use this idea to mean things of the past. And there's a tense in Hebrew called the preteric tense. And, and so there are those that think that all uh, prophecy is past. And therefore some don't believe there will be a future rapture. They think, for example, that here it comes, and here's a picture of the destruction of Jerusalem, that all the scriptures were fulfilled at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. They've already, in other words, preterite. They've already in the past been fulfilled. Now, of course, the devil would love to get our eyes off of the future fulfillment. Young people, for example, wouldn't have to be so worried about whether they were walking in holiness if they thought, well, there's really no future rapture or there's no future tribulation, or there's no future judgment. And so the, the Bible tells us very clearly, first of all, 
in First Thessalonians that the rapture and physical return of Christ are last day's events and that we will be caught up in the clouds. It'll say caught up. And that the day of the Lord in chapter 5 includes the dread tribulation and the anticipated millennium. The unsaved and the saved. Now listen, the unsaved and the saved are in view in chapter 5 verse 3. They shall not escape. I'm going to say that. They shall not escape. Now what Paul is doing here is he's talking about the unsaved. They shall not escape. It would say they shall not escape. But you, brethren, but you, brethren, two different things here. We have to think differently than they. They shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you. And the word overtake there is kapalambano, which means like, it's a, a figure of war where you would go in and, and it, it literally means to captivate someone, to grab them, to, to capture them in battle. But the day of the Lord will not capture the church because the church is going to be caught up. So we are told to keep watching. Therefore, let us, that is to say, not sleep as do others, but let us watch and what? Be sober. There it is. Watch and be sober. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Or sit that you. He has destined us. God has destined the church. Does anybody here feel a destiny in the kingdom of God? He has destined this church. Now, let's move to our last point because we have just a few moments here and we'll take a look at the question of whether or not perhaps God is limited. This is exactly what humanism, enlightenment thinking, postmodernism, all liberalism has tried to do and now we've got it in a package that even uh, uh, someone could look at it and say, well, you know, maybe God doesn't know certain things. Maybe God is limited. I want to look at a couple of things here. First of all, the, the big question is, what does God know? Now, um, the God of the Possible by Boyd, was, before he wrote the God of the Possible, possible he wrote this book against the Oneness Movement called uh, Oneness Pentecostals. And he was once Oneness and, and became a Trinitarian after attending Princeton. And in Princeton, he became very involved in the theology of Hartshorn and what are known as the process theologians. And process theology suggests that God is changing exactly like all evolution is changing. God is changing just like we're changing. And as a part of the process theology doctrine, they hold this notion that God therefore doesn't know uh, a great deal, certainly anything in the future, he doesn't know that. And so we look at this question of open theism. Is, is the future open? And so we have four questions here. Does God know anything beyond this moment? Well, most would say, well, he might know some things. For example, he could declare that certain things would happen. Is everybody still awake? Are we okay? Okay, we've got a few more seconds here. Can we handle it? All right, just a few minutes here. So the question is, does God know anything past this moment? Well, they'll answer this in different ways. But the moment you think you can judge, let me tell you something, folks. It doesn't matter what you think, whether God knows it or not. He knows what He knows, and I know what I know. And I know I'm saved, and I know that I know that the Word of God is true. I put my faith upon the Word of God. You see this, this notion where now I'm going to judge God, and I think I'm going to try to decide whether God knows the future. And this is wrapped in all kinds of theological discussion. But, of course, the first question is, does he know anything beyond this moment? Well, they might say he does. He might know something about the future. Like, he may declare, for example, there would be an end of the world. And if he declares it, then he knows that because he declared it. They don't know how to explain he could declare it, but he declared it. And so they might say yes, they might say no. And then, of course, the next question is the one that catches most people. Is the future still possible? In other words, when I pray, do I make a difference to the future? And so they say, well, if prayer has any meaning, then God cannot know the future. Because if God knows the future, he's controlling the future. Or as we heard a moment ago, he's causing the future to occur. Is everybody still awake? Are we okay? Now the question is, I, I'm not sure you can... I, I'm, I'm trying to be uh, absolute... <laughs> a, a little smile, just a little smile. Okay. Now, let's look at this third one. The question then we are led to is, does God know only what might be? That's what Boyd has concluded. He's the God of the possible. He knows that you might be saved. He knows that you might live in Indianapolis. He knows that because he's so smart, 
be so small that he can guess it pretty good. And he can know your character so much that he can even determine that you might actually do something. Not know it for certain, but he can know the character of men and know all the world so com- in all of its complexity that he more than any other being might be able to determine this is probably what would happen. And of course, when you ask Boyd, what if he got it wrong? What if he lied? What if he failed? Well, that, he doesn't want you to ask that question. But of course, you have to ask that question. Because the Bible doesn't say he, what a mighty guesser we've got. Okay, you're not going to stay with me. So, does, does God not know for certain the future? I'm telling this group that God knows all things. He's a mighty God. He knows all. He knows exhaustively. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, o Lord, thou knowest it all together. This is the Hebrew word kol or kola in certain places, but it means completely. He knows me. He knows my word even before it's born. And I'm, I'm not going to spend much more time here. My point, though, is that if we follow the logic of the culture, it will take us to questioning whether or not the Bible's true, whether or not God knows certain things. But my heart cries out and says, Lord, Oh, how I love thy law. Oh, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. But you see, an arrogant person can never say that because they're always going to have to stay a little bit above the Word. But you cannot stay above the Word. You cannot be above the Word. You're not above God. God will have a people. The Almighty, the Word Almighty itself includes foreknowledge. He even knew the birth of a man long before in Isaiah 44, Cyrus Peter, he knew every detail. Let's look at this real quick. Everybody say hallelujah. A couple more points. Let's make one more point. And then we'll stop every detail of Peter's denial. Now, the reason I'm using this one is all of my openest friends will say, well, and they'll use examples where supposedly God didn't know something. And, and I'll say, well, the Bible also says he had feathers. And, and it, 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 it's like the chicks come under him. You don't take that. I mean, you don't think that's literal, do you? That God's a chick and he's got little chicks running under him? That's figurative. You've got to, I mean, you can And then when you go to some other scripture and say, let's take a look at that. In other words, when they want to limit God, that they want, they want to be literal. Well, I, that's a very poor hermeneutic, number one. And if you're just doing it to please a bunch of processed theologians who not even sure if there's a God out there, but if there is one, he's a part of the cosmos and he's moving along like the stars and he's changing right now. Let me tell you something, folks. This is a time to get a hold of this book and love it with all of your heart. So, show me, show me, show me, show me right now. Show me, show me. How could God know the number of times Peter would deny him? Tell, show me. How could he guess that? Your good guesser theory is falling to pieces. How about the timing? We know exactly when. How about the future leadership of Peter, which would come much later? Here Peter is wrestling with, I don't know what to do, I'm not sure. And he denies the Lord. And, and yet the Lord says, yes, but I, I know your future, Peter. In fact, I, I declare that if you begin to limit God and in any way, you have begun to destroy Him. And it is the little foot in the door but is there anyone here this morning? And I'm, I'm all out of time. Could anybody stand with me and say, I believe God is almighty and I'm trusting him with my future, my past, my present. Come on, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Father, we are yours today. Lord, we are surrendered to your purpose. Your eyes can see my substance. Yet be perfect, Lord. When yet there were none of them, you knew me, Lord, and I thank you. One more time, let's clap our hands and praise him, because he alone is worthy. Praise God. Praise God. Brother Talmadge French, God bless you.